morning, everyone. Oh, there you are. We're so glad you're here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Don't you love the sunshine today? As W.B. Bean used to say, sunshine on mud, prettiest thing in the world, and it is wonderful, this part of the world, to see that good rain we got. Well, we're glad to see the sunshine. We're glad you're here to worship with us this Sunday after Thanksgiving. Let's turn to number 192, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Let's stand and sing it together. And thanks to Roy Jones for playing the piano for us today. Glad to have him here. 192. Praise be to the Lord. That's a beautiful, beautiful song. Amen? Amen. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Amen. Y'all ready for Christmas now? No? It's going to be here soon. Amen? Um, and so we're going to celebrate Advent as a church. And um, what Advent is, is it is us looking forward to Jesus' coming over the next few weeks. And of course, Jesus has already came. And so we are also looking forward to His second coming. And so this is just a way for us each Sunday as we get ready for Christmas Day uh, to prepare our hearts um, for what Christmas truly means. And so I have some readers who are going to come up here and read a few things, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to light a candle, uh, and we'll light all these candles um, one by one each week as we go. is a simple yet profound act. It's a testimony to the power of light over darkness. The light of just one candle can push away the darkness. As we light the first candle of Advent, we begin our journey to Christmas. The first candle of Advent is called the hope, or better yet, the prophecy candle. As we anticipate Christmas, let us remember those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Many prophecies were given about the coming Messiah. We can read of these in the Old Testament. A few of those great prophecies concerning the coming Savior we will read today as we light this candle of hope. The prophet Micah proclaimed, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, 
from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Micah 5 2. And the prophet Isaiah foretold, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7 14. He also proclaimed, The root of Jesse will, will spring up, one who will arise to be ruler over the nations. In him the Gentiles will set their hope. Isaiah 11.10 Like the prophets of old, God's people are called to have hope in God through the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and that we as God's people are to place our hope in His Word. We do this because in His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. So this Advent season, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you so much for being the God of hope. God, as we go through this holiday season, help us to share that hope with others. Help us to reflect on the hope that you have given us and help us to be thankful and carry on blessing, carry on the thankfulness for all the blessings that you've given us. God, I pray that we could just exhibit hope to everyone we encounter. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank y'all for coming up here and doing that. Amen, amen. And if you're just itching to come up here and read one of these next week, you know where to find me. Amen. But thank y'all so much for reading that. It's good stuff. So he is the God of hope. Amen. Praise God for his hope. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we encourage you um, to fill out one of the visitor cards, and you can put those uh, in the offering box there in the foyer. Um, a few announcements here. Christmas music program rehearsal today will be at 2.30 p.m. Uh, it's 2.30. And then on Wednesday night at 6.30, there will be also another rehearsal. Uh, this is an important one because this is the one that the kids are going to be involved in. Um, and so kids, uh, parents, I guess I should say, if you want your kids to be in this, um, try to have them here on Wednesday. If for some reason you don't get them here on Wednesday, I still think we can get them in of uh, the program. But Wednesday at 6.30 uh, will be that practice. Um, we'll pick back up all of our Wednesday night Bible studies, our youth, our children's ministry, um, ladies' Bible study. They are now going to be studying the fruits of the Spirit, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. I think this week they're going to do joy, um, and that's going to be a great study. So we just encourage you women uh, to get involved with that men's Bible study as well. Um, also want to encourage you to think about giving, if you haven't already, to the Christmas missions offering. Uh, we take this offering all the way to Christmas Day, and we will then divide it between different mission agencies. Um, and my challenge last week, I'm going to keep bringing it up. Okay, so say for my son, we spend $100 on Christmas for him. I'm going to encourage my own heart through the Scriptures and through the encouragement of making known his name among the nations to give at least $100 to this mission offering over the next five weeks. Now, I say that to also say this, give as you decide to give. Don't think that you have to do that. But if you want a little challenge, I think that's a fun little challenge. Um, and just allow the Holy Spirit to lead God and direct you on that. And the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Okay. Uh, Sunday school for all ages. Now, I am going to encourage you to get in Sunday school every, every week, okay? But really this week. Because next Sunday, that's December the 4th, we start a new quarter in our Sunday school classes. And we're going to be going through the Gospel of John. Now, how many of us have ever read through the Gospel of John? We need to go read our Bibles, church. Okay, because that's like one of those that we should read. Um, the Gospel of John is one of the greatest books ever written. Uh, and it is going to be very good. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a good class uh, to be in through um, I believe, winter, and then we're going to pick it back up, the second part of the book, in spring. So uh, we encourage you to get involved in Sunday school uh, this December. Our holiday meal will be next Sunday, December the 4th. Um, I think we're all excited for that. 
Uh, if you don't bring anything, that is okay. Bring your appetite uh, and come and fellowship with us next Lord's Day after worship. Um, Christmas, Christmas music program will be on the 11th, so that's the following week that's coming up. Happy birthday, Jesus, December 18th, um, and many more fun things to come during Christmas. I also have another thing here on our bulletin. Uh, read through the Gospel of Luke. So if you haven't read John, let's read Luke in December. Uh, there are 24 chapters okay, in the Gospel of Jesus according to Luke. And so if you kind of use that as your own Advent calendar. So on Thursday the 1st, that is this Thursday, if you'll open up your Bible, you can even pull it up on a phone these days on a Bible app, or maybe just listen to it. It's however you want to do it, okay? Read a chapter a day, and it'll prepare your heart so that on Christmas Eve, you'll sit there, and you'll say, hey, I read through the whole gospel of Luke, the life of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to encourage you to think about doing that. Um, Any more announcements? Okay, y'all excited to be here? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you, God, that you are the God of hope. Lord, we thank you that in Jesus we have been born again to a living hope. God, this Christmas season, Lord, help us to reflect our trust and our faith and our hope in you and all that we do, Lord Jesus. God, as we gather here this morning, I ask for your Holy Spirit to just touch our hearts, God, through the music. Uh, Touch our hearts, Lord Jesus, through the sermon. Um, God, help us, Lord Jesus, to grow in grace and help us to respond in faith, Lord Jesus. God, we pray that you be with all those that are on the prayer concern list, God. Um, We just ask that you continue to be with them and strengthen them and watch over them, Lord. We pray for all the other churches around the world. We pray for all the missionaries, God. We just ask, Lord, that through our giving, uh, we just ask, God, that you bless that giving and that they can use that for your eternal glory. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Uh, We thank you for safe travels over this past week. And as we um, prepare our hearts, Lord, for this Christmas season, we just ask for your spirit to fill us with much hope. We ask this as your people, and we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you, Brother Dalton. Again, I thank Roy Jones for playing the piano for us today. Melinda is uh, often at University Baptist Church in Fort Worth, seeing our uh, youngest, our 11-month-old grandson, they're having baby dedication there this morning, and she wanted to be there for that. And so I appreciate Roy uh, playing the piano for us today. As we prepare our hearts to hear about God being with us, we're going to sing number 160, Just When I Need Him Most. Let's stand together and sing that, 160. Just for- 
singing. You may be seated. Choir, you're dismissed. Thank you for being up here this morning. Now it's time for the children to come and hear a, have a visit with Wendy this morning. All the children here are welcome to come up to the front here. Good morning. Is everybody here? Okay, you can hear me. Good morning. Look at all these faces. Come on. It's okay, come down. We need lots of friends. It's really scary if you're down here by yourself. Come on. Do you sit right there? Do you sit right there? Perfect. Anybody else? Any other takers? Okay. So, have you noticed the weather's different outside? It's getting chillier. Yes, it's because we have seasons, right? It's going to be warm, but then it's going to be cold again. That's the way we do in Texas. And then Christmas, that's right. This is the season of Christmas, isn't it? What? The next Christmas your house is going to be done. That's awesome news. I know your dad and your mom are proud. Awesome. Okay, so our Bible verse is Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do you know anything that stays the same? No. I don't either because you all grow. We all grow, our hair changes, our fingernails grow, everything. So our eyes change too. I know, I can't see. I have to wear my glasses, right? My eyes are brown. That's right. Okay, so, but Jesus stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. So our lesson today is about leaves. And my lovely assistant went out and got me some real leaves. So, they're turning colors, aren't they? So, this one, wait. So, they were more green like this when it was summertime, and they got water, if they got water. And then they started turning, and the leaves like this. So, see how they turned? Some of them got brown. You want to sit up here? Okay. That's awesome. Okay, so we have, they're different colors. So, it says, during autumn, all the leaves on the trees start to change colors. That some, when Ellen and I were driving, we noticed there were red, there were orange, there were yellow, there were brown. It's a beautiful time of year, even here in Texas, that the trees are changing. And it says, then what happens? When they change colors, what happens after that? Do they fall to the ground? Oh, Christmas. I know. You're into Christmas, buddy. 
I love it. But the leaves will fall to the ground and die, right? And then what do you do? Does your mom or your dad or your grandparents, do you have to go help? Good morning. Thank you, Ray Ray, for coming. Come up here. Come on. There we go. That's the way I show up, too. Coming in last, always. Um, so anyway, it says they fall to the ground. That's why we call it the fall season. Who knew that, right? Did you know that before today? You did? Oh, my gosh, you're super smart. Because I'm not real sure I'd ever thought about it. But because the leaves fall, we name it the fall season. And then we rake the leaves. We can jump and play in them. Alan grabs a lot about the leaves. He doesn't like leaves. And then it says, did you know, like our Bible verse, God is not like these leaves. Because in Hebrews 13, 8, as we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. It means that he will be the same tomorrow, too. We can trust him, rely on him, and depend on him. So the leaves grow. They're blown by the wind. They change colors. They die, and they fall to the ground. But Jesus will never change like that. God is faithful and trustworthy. We can always rely on him to do what he says and keep his promises. His word is always true. There was another Bible verse that I thought was awesome. Malachi 3, 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. And so um, I've got a leaf for you to take to remember as you're out and about and you're driving down the road. You can see all these pretty leaves that change and fall. But you know that God is always faithful, and he doesn't change. So let's bow our heads and say a prayer. Does anybody want to say the prayer? You do? You want to say the prayer? Oh, okay. Well, how about we take turns? Can we both say the prayer? Can you say, and then we're going to pass it back here? Okay, so let's bow our heads. And it has the Lord and, and, and Jesus praying in. Amen. Okay, now it's one more turn. That's okay. I'll say the last of it. Is that okay? You want to say it? Dear Jesus, let us have food and grow food and we'll have a house home for our house and our and all of our houses will be strong. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy and kids. What a great group. We appreciate Gary Wiley for building this manger we have up here this Sunday. He's not here today for us to pat him on the back, but when you see him, thank him for doing that. We'll use that when we have our Christmas program here in a few weeks, and the kids will get to come up here and be angels and shepherds and all those good things, and so it'll be a fun time for them. If you don't know Tom Freeland, he is actually going to come and sing a song for us today. It, it, I, if you don't know Tom, you should get to know him. If you, I think he's, if you look in the dictionary under nice guy, you would probably find his picture in there. He's a really good fella, and I really think highly of him. His wife disagrees with me. She said, <laughs> no, it's not there, she says. But I appreciate Tom. He's going to come share a song with you this morning. Hello. Uh, all right. That sounds a whole lot better. I thought the red light was off. The red light is on. Anyway, uh, yesterday afternoon I was on the computer uh, listening to some music, and uh, I came across a song. 
red light means it might die. So we're going to take this one away. I thought red meant stop. He's on the, he's on the red one now. Hello, okay. hello. You got me now? Sorry for the confusion. This whole thing's been confusion. Um, again, yesterday afternoon I was listening to music on the computer, and uh, I came across a song that I have on a CD from Cindy's dad, Leon. And Cindy's dad was a real special person to me. I had great parents growing up. They've been gone a long time. And when I married Cindy, that was a blessing. But the extra blessing came along with her parents. Her mother and dad were two of the finest Christian people that you could ever meet. And her dad and I uh, got to be good friends. And he's very special to me, or was very special. He passed away around Thanksgiving time two years ago. So every Thanksgiving, um, there's a lot of things around the holidays that uh, kind of make me sad from time to time. But that one was landed on my heart yesterday as I came across this song that he used to sing or did sing uh, in church. He sang a lot in church, uh, quite a bit. Um, he wasn't a great singer, but you had to know him to appreciate his songs because they always came from his heart. And so if you knew the man, you just loved to listen to him sing because you know where that was coming from. So this song I'm fixed to sing is called Remind Me, Dear Lord. And it's a song that he sung. And I had thought for years um, since I've known him that I would love to be able to sing a song with him at church, but I was always too embarrassed to do that. Um, because I'm not a great singer. I just, uh, I, I enjoy it. Uh, but I was always afraid to. But yesterday, when I was singing this song at home, God laid it on my heart. And so I called Randy, and I had recorded it on my phone, and I sent him the recording. And I said, would it be all right? Uh, would this be good enough to sing at church? And he listened to it, texted me back a few minutes, said, yes, that, that would be fine. So, uh, I told him, I said, I may have to use a cheat sheet for the words because I, I don't know if I remember all this. It's not very long, but, you know, and he said, well, he said, you don't have to do that, but it would be more polished. That was his comment. And so I thought, there's two things wrong with that. One thing is, I'm 75 years old, fixing to be 76, I can't even remember common words in a conversation a lot of times. And the other thing is, I don't know that I'm polished in anything. So I'm going to use the cheat sheet that I've got here in front of me. You just have to excuse that. So polished or unpolished, you get what you get. So um, maybe Leon is listening in heaven, and uh, I hope so. Go ahead. Just borrow, they're not mine at all. Jesus only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of me. Show me where you brought me from, where I could have been. Remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, you know. Nothing good have I done to deserve. God's own son, I'm not worthy 
of the scars in his hands. Yet he chose the road to Calvary to die for my sin. Why he loved me, I don't understand. So roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Amen, Tom. Amen. Praise be to God. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25 this morning. Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 25. As we approach Christmas, we're going to look at a few passages uh, in our Bibles together uh, that do with the birth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His incarnation and Him coming to dwell with men. And so the first one we're going to look at here is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, the birth announcement from the angel Gabriel to Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. So verse 18 tells us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for this time that we have as your people uh, to hear your word. And God, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through me, speak to our hearts, Lord. Open up our minds, God, to your glorious and wonderful truth. Open up our hearts, Lord, to who you truly are. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your redemption that we have in you, Lord Jesus. And I just ask, God, that your Holy Spirit just bless this time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Theologian J.I. Packer once wrote that God created us for friendship with Himself to enjoy fellowship and communion with Him. According to Packer and the Word of God in which he's drawing this from, we find in this statement that God desires fellowship with us as His created beings. He delights in His created order, and He wants to pour out His presence upon us, and He wants us to be in His presence. He wants to fellowship and commune with us. It's a very true statement. But the only problem is God desires fellowship with man, but here's the question. Does man desire fellowship and communion and relationship with God. Now, that is a big theological question. I'm not going to keep you here for five hours to try to figure it out and draw that out. 
But we can go back to the Garden of Eden. We can see a very short and clear, precise answer. Before the fall, before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, what did they do? They walked with, everybody say with, with God. But of course, we know the story, right? Their disobedience, sin into the world. And when they realized that they had sinned and they were unclean and unholy and they understood that, when God came looking for them, what did they do? They played hide and seek with God. They didn't want to be in His presence because of what? Because of their sin. And as we continue to read in chapter 3, we then find in Genesis there that one of the punishments because of their disobedience is that they would be what? They would be kicked out of Eden. And so here we see this separation between God and man. And so back to Packer's very theological and biblical statement. God created us for friendship with Himself, to enjoy fellowship and communion with Him. But how is God going to accomplish this? How is God going to befriend man? How is God going to commune and have this way and make this way for eternal fellowship and communion between man and God? How is this relationship going to take place between sin and holiness, between spirit and dust, between heaven and earth? I think we find the answer in one word. One word that you probably have already said a few times this week. Maybe you saw some lights in the sky or on a roof somewhere. Maybe you put up a tree to honor this time. Maybe you've been singing some good old Christmas songs. If you're in the choir, you've been singing them since September. And that one word is this, Christmas. You see, Christmas is the promise of God's presence with us. Christmas is God's pursuit of Him fellowshipping and pursuing us and abiding in us. It is God saying, I want to dwell with my creatures and I want to have relationship with them. Christmas is God bringing heaven down in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and through our faith in Him and what He has done for us, we can forever be before the face of Almighty God in glory. Christmas is the promise, as Matthew tells us, about Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so this morning, as we look at this passage, I want to primarily focus here on verse 23. And this promise that God is with us, and this promise I'm going to call today the promise of with And how this eternal fellowship with Almighty God, this word, this truth, this beautiful concept is something that you, my dear friend, need to cling to with all of your might this Christmas season. And to understand the beautiful promise that God has poured out His presence into your hearts. And He wants to walk, let's say it again, with, everybody say with, you as you walk with Him. And so as we go through this, I want you to see three things. I want you to see the promise spoken, the promise fulfilled, and the promise applied. Well, let's look at the promise of with spoken. Verses 18 through 21, I'm going to read that again. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the promise that is spoken here comes from the angel of the Lord, the angel Gabriel to Joseph in a dream. And guys, this is a very timely word. 
Because let's men especially sympathize with Joseph here. The lady who he is engaged to all of a sudden is pregnant, and he was not the one who impregnated her. And so there was a lot of questions. There's a lot of thoughts going through Joseph's mind and heart at the time. I mean, how many of us men would listen to our female companion and the one we're engaged to when she comes with this story? Hey, Joseph, by the way, the angel Gabriel appeared to me, and you know that long way to Messiah that, you know, your daddy talks about all the time at Shabbat, all these beautiful things about the Messiah coming I'm going to have the Messiah. And he told me that I would be conceived, or this child would be conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, how many of us would say, okay, baby, whatever you say? Now, if you're a smart, smart man, you might, you might say that, okay? But some of us who maybe aren't, aren't as smart as that, I think what we'd probably be doing is this. We'd be heartbroken. We'd be listening to some sad country song on the radio, And we'd be searching for some type of answer to what is really going on here. And God knew Joseph's heart. God knew Joseph was asking these very questions within his heart. So what does God do? Please see this. What does God do? He speaks to Joseph. Church, I want you to know that God speaks to his people. I love what the writer of Hebrews says in the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. He says, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke. God speaks to his people. God is a speaking God. Now, I know Joseph's dream here is a very unique situation in comparison to yours. Joseph would get the privilege to help raise up the Messiah and the Savior of the world. And I don't want to limit God and say God cannot speak in dreams and in visions and revelations today. He does as he pleases, and I believe that he speaks to us all in very unique ways. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to our souls when we're communing with him in prayer. The main question here is not if God speaks. We know he speaks. The main question is, are you listening to him when he speaks? Or are you placing yourself in a position to hear Thus saith the Lord. Because if you are, and you have ears to hear the word of God, you will find this out, just like Joseph did. God's word is timely, it is promising, and it is comforting to our souls. And so this Christmas season, with all the different things going on, Enjoy it. Soak it in. Absolutely. Focus in on Christ and listen to God and what He wants to say to you. And if you will listen to Him, He will speak truth into your life. He will speak direction into your life. He will speak, as we see here today, promise into your life. And I want you to see here that this promise of with that the angel Gabriel spoke to Joseph in a dream about and how God would be with us as his people. This is a promise that is throughout the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, we read that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Enoch walked so closely with God and so close into his presence that he literally did not die and was taken up to heaven, much like Elijah was. And then we get to Moses, and God is now calling Moses to go back into the land of Egypt to help bring out his people okay, from slavery and bondage. And what does Moses say? He says, God, I can't do this. God, I can't do this big task. He was very iffy about the task before him, and this is what God says. He says, oh, Moses, I will be with you. And then we go to Joshua, who is Moses' successor, and we read in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, Joshua was thinking the same thing. I'm supposed to take these people into the land of Canaan and conquer the land? Who is fit for such a task? And here's what God says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
And years later, the Midianites rose up against the people of Israel, and God set apart, set apart a mighty warrior, and the man named Gideon. And we read in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, that the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, O oh man, mighty man of valor. In Psalm chapter 46, the people of God would sing, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Hannah saw the promise of with come to pass when her answered prayer finally came and she had Samuel. David would declare the promise of with when he defeated Goliath. Solomon would receive the, this promise of with when he had the prosperity of his kingdom. The people in exile would experience this promise of God being with his people when they had favor and much grace even in exile and they were finally brought back to their land. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego literally saw Mr. With and God with us in the fiery furnace. Daniel saw this promise of with in the lion's den. Nehemiah saw the promise of with when he was rebuilding the wall. And Isaiah the prophet foretold of a time when this future fulfillment would be so much greater and this reality would be so much greater when the promise of with Emmanuel, God with us, would come to pass. You see, God, church, speaks forth his promises. You and I, we must have Ears to hear them, and even more so, church, hearts to believe them. For God speaks forth his promises. Secondly, notice the promise of with fulfilled. In verse 22, we read, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew begins his gospel account of the life of Jesus Christ by pointing us back and connecting us to what? The Old Testament. Matthew's the first book, right, in the New Testament. And he makes a chain link connection showing us, because he's primarily wrote to a Jewish audience, and these people who he's writing to would have known the Scriptures, they would have known the law, they would have known the prophets, and he's writing to show them that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has fulfilled these prophecies. And the one he points us to here is in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Emmanuel, God with us. And so the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem would bring forth a deeper reality of the fact that God is with us as his people. And that is what Christmas is all about, church. And a beautiful truth here is that um, Matthew centers his gospel around Jesus' kingship. And he labors to show that this king that he's writing about, Jesus Christ, is not your ordinary king. He is greater than David. He is greater than Solomon. He is greater than Hezekiah. He is a great and glorious king. He is so great that he will be with and dwell with his people for all of eternity. And so we have this promise here in chapter 1, verse 23. But I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible open, to come with me to the very last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and see how he kind of bookends this beautiful promise of God's presence. And so Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And this is a very familiar passage. This is the great commission that he's given to his disciples before he ascends into heaven. And here we have not the angel Gabriel telling us about Emmanuel. We have Emmanuel himself giving forth this promise to his disciples who would be his church, that's you and I. And so he says, "'Go therefore and make disciples of all nations.'" baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Did y'all catch that? 
I am with you always to the end of the age. And so Jesus is saying here, yes, in my incarnation, yes, I came to dwell with men. I lived the perfect life that you could not live. I bore your sin upon the cross. I conquered death, hell, and the grave, and now I'm about to ascend into heaven. But that is not the end of me being with my people. No, this is just the beginning of a greater, greater thing, a dawning of a new era in how you personally as individuals You will be temples in which the Holy Spirit of God will dwell in. So every child of God and every believer within their person literally has his presence living in them. What a beautiful promise this is. We read that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And in Revelation 21, that there'll be no more crying, no more death, no more sin, no more mourning. And the dwelling place of God will be with man. And so this future taste of glory that we have been given through this beautiful promise of God's presence with us is just the beginning because one day we're going to leave these old rotten bodies and be with Jesus Christ and in his presence for all of eternity. But until then, please know this that you can rest assured that God will never leave you or forsake you because he is with you. And God is going to be with you always to the end of the age. And you can know for certain that the third verse of a way in a manger is not yours on a leap of faith, but it is a fact and it is a certainty of this eternal benefit that you have because of your faith in Jesus. You're probably wondering what the third verse of a way in the manger is. Here it is. Be near me, Lord Jesus. I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Because the Spirit of God lives in you, this is who you are. You have God's presence living in you. God with us. Now, what do you do with this promise? What should you do with this promise of with this Christmas season? How can you apply this truth, this great truth that God is with you always to the end of the age? How can you apply this to your life? This leads us to our third heading, and that is the promise of with applied. You see, we can see and we can read over and over again that God is with us and God is with his people, but if we don't act in faith and do something with, with the promise of with, then we are missing the glorious grace of the gospel in which God in Christ wants us to live out for his eternal glory. David Livingstone, who is a Scottish doctor, and a great pioneer missionary in Africa during the 1800s. He once said that it was the promise of God's presence that kept him moving forward in what he accomplished for the glory of God in Africa. He said this, and I quote, he said, I was enabled to go on because I had the word of a perfect gentleman, never known to break a promise that he would be with me always. You see, church, one of the greatest glories of the gospel is that his presence is with us. That you can have peace of mind and heart wherever you go, that God's presence is with you. Because let me say this, when you were flat on your back in an ambulance, you're going to want to know that God is with you. When you're laid up sick in a hospital bed, you're going to want to know that God is with you. When you're weeping by the graveside of your spouse or your son or your daughter or your loved one, you're going to want to know that God is with you. When you're so paralyzed in fear and crippled with anxiety and depression that you can't even get up to turn on the light in your bedroom, you're going to want to know God with us. Because in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in your personal darkness, in the goodness of who God is, he is the light of the world, and he comes, and he shines light into your darkness, and he says, whatever is before you, dear child, 
I'm with you. Emmanuel, God with us. I know personally I draw so much encouragement and so much comfort from this glorious truth. We have the prophetic verse in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I'm kind of a weird fella, and I'm into numbers and stuff. And so every time I see on a clock at 714, I'm reminded, God with us. And it's funny. You'll be driving down the road, and you really need that, and it's 714. God with us. You need to cling to this promise as God's people. You need to live out this beautiful truth in your life as one of God's people. Because you may not have been driven to that point yet in your life, but there will come a day when His presence will be your only hope. And His presence and His truth will be your only help. And I hope I get an amen here or there in just a minute because it seems as if when you're in that moment, when you're completely backed up against the wall and you throw out the flag of surrender and you cry out to the Lord for his presence to help you and to come and to aid you and comfort you and come to your side, it seems as if then when you're in desperation mode and you're saying, God, be with me, Lord Jesus, it seems that his presence is more strong and near than ever before. Amen? And because of Emmanuel, Psalm 46, verse 1, is truth to our hearts. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's with us in our troubles, whatever we're going through. Isaiah chapter 43, the Lord says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Have you ever gone through rivers? Have you ever gone through fires, church? What a glorious truth that God is with you. I know somebody needs to hear this today. Whatever you're worried about, whatever you're worked up about, Whatever is before you that you're just saying, I just don't know if I can do this, God is whispering in your ear today. Maybe the preacher needs to shout it for you to hear it. God is with you. And you have this promise in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church, God promises to be with you in the good days. He promises, promises to be with you in the bad days. He promises to be with you on Sundays and Mondays and every day. He promises to be with you in sorrow and in suffering, on the mountaintop, on the valley low, at the deathbed, at the graveside. God with us both now and forever. And check this out. If God is for you, Or if God is with you, that means God is for you. And if God is for you, then that means he will never forsake you. And if he will never forsake you, then who in the world could ever be against you? Because God is with you. Charles Spurgeon, who ministered the gospel in London in the 19th century, he says these beautiful words about Emmanuel. He says, Emmanuel... God with us. It's hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and you but whisper that word, God with us. Back he falls confounded and confused. God with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor own his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? Oh, God with us. It is eternity's music. It's heaven's hallelujah. It's the shout of the glorified. It's the song of the redeemed. It's the chorus of the angels. It's the everlasting hymn of the great orchestra of the sky. Oh, God with us. What a glorious promise. 
that God desired fellowship with you so much that even though you were a sinner and an enemy of God, God chose to send forth His Son to pursue fellowship with you by taking the form of a man dwelling upon this earth, pitching His tent upon this earth, dying on the cross for your sins so that by your faith in Him you could be forgiven of your sins and He could send forth His Holy Spirit and you could have His presence forever. And church, that's what Christmas is all about. That Jesus, our Savior, was born. So the next time you feel alone, remember that as a child of the risen King, God is with you. Next time you're suffering and you feel like that suffering is never going to end, God is with you. Next time you feel that the work is never going to get done and the load is just heavy, rejoice because God is with you. Next time you feel inadequate and unable to do whatever is before you, God is with you. Next time you're going through a hard time, which seems like it's more times than not, remind yourself deep down that God is with you. Next time you need guidance, have ears to hear that God is with you. With the power of God in your life, there is no mountain before you that cannot be moved. There is no river that you cannot cross, and there is no sea that cannot be calmed. For God with you is your battle cry. It's your everlasting joy. It's your steadfast hope. It's your assurance of eternal victory. Now, everybody in this room, let's say that God with you. God with you. What a glorious presence that is. What a glorious promise that is. I want to close with a story, and I'm almost done. read this not too long ago. A guy, he was a rider, and he took three weeks off of work to go ride. And so what he did was he rented a condo, a big condo, so his whole family could come. And during the days, he would stay at the condo and ride, um, and then the family would go off and do all the fun stuff. They would go to the amusement parks. They went to the beach. They went to the nice restaurants. They went to the mall. They went to the zoo. They ate steaks. They went to the water parks. They went to the movies. They had a great and glorious time while the dad is working on this writing project. And he tells about the 15th day, he realized that, you know what, he maybe should spend some time with his family. And so he takes his teenage daughter, and they go on a little walk to an ice cream shop. And he starts to engage his teenage daughter and ask her what her favorite part of the trip was. And to his surprise, that girl looked up to his dad, to her dad, and said, Dad, the favorite part of my vacation is this, for you are with me. You see the amusement parks, the surfboards, boogie boards, beach, steak, shopping, all of that fun could not compete with daddy's presence. You see, at the end of the day, we as God's children, we have been granted a beautiful gift during the Christmas season and every season of our lives by faith, and that is the gift of his presence. And so rejoice this Christmas and cling to the promise of with in your life. Delight in the fellowship and friendship that is yours in Christ Jesus Walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus, do all that you do with Jesus because Jesus is the promise. He is the person and he is the power of Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you so much, God, that you are with us right here. This very moment as we Bow our heads, Lord Jesus, in prayer. God, we thank you for the word that we received. We thank you for the promise that we have received that your presence is always with us. God, we thank you for pursuing us when we ran the opposite direction. We thank you for dwelling with us, God. And I just ask that this Christmas season, Lord, that we just be reminded over and over again of the beautiful promise that we are with you, God, that you are living in us. No matter what we go through in this life, oh God, we can walk with you through it. and You will walk with us through it all. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. We thank you for saving us from our sins. God, I just pray that you help us to respond in faith here this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. I want to say a few words. And so now we're going to open up this altar. And we just heard the word of God. And I just want to encourage you that this is our time now to respond to the word of God in faith. And so if you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ before, today is the day of salvation, for you are not promised tomorrow. If you want to join this fellowship and you feel led to come down here today, now is the time to do it. If you need prayer and you want to come pray with me, come pray with me. If you don't want to come pray with me, that's okay. Just come down here and pray. But I just want everybody to know that this altar is open. And if you don't come down during this time, that's okay because God can save you right where you're at. Yes, but it is a time of stepping out in faith. And I also want to say this. After the service, if you just need to get something off of your chest, if you just need someone to talk to, I'm always out there mingling around, and I'll stay here as long as I need to. But I just believe that after the Word is preached, it is a time that the Holy Spirit does wonders in our hearts. And so we just want to open up this altar for you to respond in faith. Let's stand together. Sing number 423. I'm going to have Mr. Ron and Ms. Pam McCullough come stand up here for just a second. Uh, They feel led by the Spirit of God today to move their membership over here to Salt Creek, and we're super excited about that. Amen to that. And so I just want to bring this before the church, and you've already clapped and you've said amen, but uh, let's just bring this before you. How about we say amen and clap again? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, but we're super excited. Uh, we've heard a lot of good things about y'all, and we're just excited that you're going to be a part of this fellowship. Amen? Amen. Uh, again, just wanted to ask you to just put your hand out, um, and as I pray over them, you as well just 
come alongside me and pray. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy in our lives. God, I thank you for Ron and Pam, and Lord, we just pray a special blessing over them. God, we thank you that you have brought them uh, to this body of believers. Uh, We thank you, God, for their gifts in the church. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you love them and you care for them, God, and we're just excited about them being here, Lord. And we just commit as a body now, we commit as Salt Creek Baptist Church to love these beautiful people, God, to love your people, uh, to do life with them, to do ministry with them, and to give you all the glory in all of it. And Lord, so we just pray a special blessing of grace and peace over their lives, over their family. God, I ask the same thing over all of our church family. We just ask that you lead God and direct them as we go forth. I pray that you as the God of hope will fill us with all joy and peace and believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's join hands and sing our closing song. You can come around and visit them, greet them from this side over here after the after the closing song. <laughs>